Um, my name is Roger Weeks. I am with Data Center Systems, and I'm going to give you an overview of ActiveScale. Um, Phil Bollinger talked about this, but I just wanted to walk you back through the history here. So Amplidata was founded in 2008, so we're on year 10 of that journey into uh, erasure coded object storage, if you will. Um, just to remind you, they had a product called Amplistore. We partnered with them in 2014 as HGST, which is right about the time I joined this team. Um, and we acquired them the following year. We have since then launched several different products based on that code. Um, the first was an active archive system in 2015. We have a new version of that <coughs> software called ActiveScale, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, and in the last year and a half, uh, we have gone to an agile development model, which means we've been able to put out more releases more quickly. Uh, ActiveScale 5.2 recently was released, and there should be at least one more release uh, this calendar year, possibly two, depending on how fast our engineers can go. We also introduced a couple of hardware systems uh, in the last couple of years, and I'll be talking about those as well. So here's the one pretty slide. Um, ActiveScale is scale out object storage. That's the whole design behind this. It is all erasure coded object storage. Um, it scales <coughs> inside the data center and across multiple geographies, depending on the, requ the requirements of the customer. Can I ask a little more deeply about the erasure coding? I have slides. Great. <laughs> I have many slides on the erasure coding. Um, we've also introduced replication in this latest release, and I'll go into that as well. Um, and I'll talk about the multi-site geo availability zones um, and scale up and scale out how that works. So just some of the key things that I'm going to be talking about in the architecture, um, what our erasure coding is, how it works, how our data integrity works, a couple of trademark names there, um, how we scale up in a single site, how we scale out in a single site, how we s replicate, and then how we scale across uh, what we call an availability zone, which is a, a three-site uh, geo uh, erasure-coded storage. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about our basic architecture is that metadata and data are not stored together. They are stored separately, which gives us a couple of advantages in speed as far as lookups and as also as far as writes, because the metadata is written while the object is being written in the background. Um, it also means that we can protect the metadata by spreading it, again, across multiple physical locations, including geographies. Um, a couple of concepts here. There are system nodes and storage nodes in the architecture. The system nodes are the ones that store the metadata. The storage nodes are the ones that do the heavy lifting with the erasure coding and actually store the data somewhere on a spinning disk. So let's get right into um, BitSpread, which is our erasure coding algorithm. There's a pretty animation here. So a couple of things about this. There's no pre-assigned locations. The way that BitSpread works, it allocates data based on the system capacity, system health, um, a couple, some predictive analytics based on what it thinks the system is going to be doing over time based on how fast have I been filling things up. If I, ha if I have too much stuff on you know, this drive, I need to make sure that I'm not putting too much stuff on it in the next 24 hours. Can I ask for a few more details on how you're doing that, the allocation? I'm going to get to that in the next slide, actually. Although we also, and I will get to, um, I'll just go to that right now. There's a nice white paper for you to check out on our website that has details about the math, which I know you're going to be interested in, and which is definitely not my strong suit. Um, this is a simple two-chunk example of how that allocation works. And for any of you who've seen erasure coding algorithms, obviously this is a very simplified version because we're only doing two chunks. Um, our system would take any file written in and allocate it to 18 chunks, which are then spread across a storage column. And a storage column in our systems is a collection of storage nodes. That can be as few as six. It can be as many as 18. Then that can spread across multiple geographies, and we'll get to how that works um, on another slide. But the nut of it is, is that we are mathematically encoding every one of these files into a series of chunks and distributing those chunks across multiple hard drives in every one of our systems. How that is distributed is at a couple of different layers. The metadata is separated from the data and is distributed in a uh, replicated database across all the tops of our systems. And then the data itself is written into chunks in any number of columns in that system. And I'll talk about what that columns mean when we get to the physical hardware and what that looks like. 
in the background is a similar process called bit dynamics. And what bit dynamics does is it continuously scans all of those erasure coded chunks. So it's doing background reads of every erasure coded chunk. It's redoing the math to make sure that everything that's on the disk actually replicates what we wrote the first time. Um, if it encounters any errors, it re-encodes that data and spreads it out to new disks. Um, and we work, again, since we're integrated with the hard drive itself, if we, de if we detect a smart error in one of the hard drives, for example, this background process will kick off a, rep uh, a re erasure encoding of anything that might be on that drive, so we can then mark the drive as not available. Um, a key thing about this is, and we've done lots of verification on this, is the background erasure coding, pro the background erasure checking process does not affect our system performance. And we validated that to some very serious things where we've unplugged a 98 drive disk shelf, plugged it back in, and let it rebuild all of that while we're doing performance testing to it, and the system performance does not degrade. So it's a, a fairly, uh, it's a fairly cool process. And again, it's all automatic, happens with no real intervention from the system manager. So, but you'd, you'd also do erasure coding rebuild if you detected that there was a problem on read or something like that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a number of system checks that go on, and if it detects any kind of problems, they would rebuild anything that is on that particular section of the system. Uh, and you have what I would consider end to end data protection. So, mm -hmm. when an object is recorded, you know, there's a checksum or something like that. And it's checked on, yes. you know, it's checked on, it's delivered on write and checked on read. That is correct. So, this is a strongly consistent system. So, we don't act the write until all of these bits have been written and verified that they're there. And that's something that comes from Ampli-Data early on. That's how our systems have been designed uh, from the beginning. GeoSpread is an ability for us to do that same erasure coding process across multiple sites. So whereas many systems will replicate across multiple geos, what we do here is if in this particular example, if you're writing a file in Paris, that file is ingested in Paris and it is then chunked into 18 blocks, actually in this case 20, the numbers are different between whether we're local or whether we're remote like this. It's chunked into enough blocks to go to Paris and Amsterdam such that if one of these three sites goes offline, we can still do the erasure coding of enough chunks to read that data back from either of the two surviving sites. Um, as you can imagine, depending on your network performance, this is not a super high performance option. Um, if you have, however, multiple 10 gigabit links between your sites, the latency is pretty reasonable. But we're still, you know, we can't break the laws of physics. We still have to deal with latency between sites. For large-scale media archives, however, this is a really cool solution, and I'll get into that uh, kind of at the end of the presentation. Um, what else to say about GeoSpread? Um, so you support more than three sites, I guess. That's yes and no, and I'll get to how we do that. But the, the basis of this is three sites. Um, and again, that goes down to how do we protect the metadata? You want to at least have two copies of metadata somewhere. But the point here to make is this is a single erasure-coded copy. It's not replication, and we're so for a two-copy replication, we're about, I guess we would be about 80% of the efficiency of that. For three-copy replication, it's, it's a kind of a no-brainer um, that this would be much more efficient. Can you go more than three? No, not today. But what we can do is we can create regions and replicate between two sets of those. So with ActiveScale 5.2, we introduce replication. It's replication between any active scale system and any other active scale system. So if we have one unit in one site and one unit in another site, there's ac you can do asynchronous replication between those. If you have these uh, availability zones, you can set up something that looks a lot like, you know, insert large over <laughs> here, where you've got an availability zone in the western US, an availability zone in the eastern US, and you can replicate between them. At the bucket level, so depending on what you need to replicate, you can choose based on, based on that. Um, and again, it's the number of sites you need. So no, we can't do the th 3GEO with more than three. three, but we can replicate between those sites. Let's talk a little bit about the hardware that we've got available. There's two sets of hardware. Uh, the P100 is. And, 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 the, oh, and the replication's sorry. asynchronous? Asynchronous. I don't believe there's any current plans to do synchronous replication. Um, but as you know, synchronous replication across geos is complicated. And, and the data is not um, compressed or deduplicated or something like that before 
the data is not compressed or deduplicated. It can be encrypted both in flight and at rest, but we don't do compression or, or deduplication natively inside ActiveScale. Um, the two hardware things that we do offer today are the P100 and the X100. I'm going to take the blame for actually these names because I was in our marketing team when we decided <laughs> to know. Um, P was supposed you. to stand for PETA, X was supposed to stand for Exascale. It's, it's a clever marketing term that really doesn't mean anything. The, the P100 is our base entry unit. You can start as low as um, 700 terabytes in, in six, uh, I think it's 12U. Um, and then the X100 is a full rack scale system that um, stores up to 5 and 5.8 petabytes in a rack at this point. I lose track of what our current hard drive capacities are as we keep changing them. Um, I'll just go into some details if you want the feeds and speeds here. Um, a full rack of the P100 can uh, ingest or read about 8, gig 8 gigabytes a second. That's S3 or S3A, and we'll talk about S3A when our next uh, speaker comes up. Um, it uses a pretty reasonable <coughs> amount of power, and uh, the data durability is something that we calculate, again, based on the erasure coding algorithm um, and how, again, there's math in that white paper that talks about how we calculate that. Um, this will scale up to about 18 petabytes if you're scaled up. And the way we scale these up is they come in pods, basically. You order a, a basic system and you can scale it up in scale out kits into a full rack, which gives you about 2.1 petabytes in a single rack. And again, starting at a, a capacity of about 720 terabytes. The X100 is our big system. Again, it's a 42U rack. Uh, it has 588 drives in here at 12 terabytes each, so its uh, raw storage is about 5.7 petabytes, 5.8 petabytes. Um, this will scale to 52 petabytes in a single namespace. Um, same basic data durability as the smaller system, obviously a lot more dense. It's not as performant as the other system, and there's a reason for that, which is there are six storage nodes in here that are doing erasure coding. If you go back to the P100, and a full scaled up rack here, there are 18 storage nodes that are doing erasure coding, so we can actually sustain a lot more I.O. into this system. Um, but this system is a lot more dense. So there's a couple, obviously, different use cases for different reasons here. Uh, these guys will, again, scale up into nine in a single namespace. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't have multiple namespaces with more, 50, with more petabytes if you want them. It all comes down to how big do you want your failure domains to be at some point. Um, 50 petabytes is a pretty big failure domain. If you want to expand it, you probably can, but again, what happens if something really bad happens? <laughs> Some of our use cases that I'll just talk so, about really So you mean the X100 can't scale to an exabyte of storage? Is that what you're saying, Mr. No, Marketing? Not today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I didn't even know the system capabilities of it when I came up with the name, so ah. you can blame me for that. Uh, <laughs> Some of our use cases. Um, probably one of our biggest markets is media and entertainment. Um, we have customers doing all of these things. Media archives in particular are a huge use case for the X100. Um, tape replacement and augmentation. The studios that have to put hundreds and hundreds of petabytes on tape are finding that they can't keep it on tape because they need to be able to go back and get it. A good example might be any animated movie you've seen in the past 10 years. How many of those have shown up in commercials, books, t-shirts? At some point, they have to keep all of that online so that they can make more money off of it. Um, and having an online archive that's cheap and deep and fast is really compelling for them. Um, we have some customers doing transcoding and playout off of these systems as well. Um, in life sciences, bioimaging is also a huge thing because those guys keep building scanners that are more and more and more complicated with more and more data that they're generating, and they have to keep it all. Um, in many cases, they have to keep it because of legal reasons. In other cases, they want to keep it because they need to go back and compare scans from 10 years ago and say, well, what changed? And analytics, our next speaker, Mike, will talk about that. Um, but there are some interesting use cases for active scale in the analytics world. So going back to this example, just to close out, um, availability zones. This particular one is an example of a customer we have in, in Europe. They took tape archives from 49 years of performances and move them to a three-site geo that's located in these three locations in France. So now they have one copy of data. Um, this use case is on our website. It's really interesting. It's also cool because you can now go to the Montreux Jazz Festival site and stream a lot of stuff from performances over the years. 
My favorite happens to be David Bowie from around 2000, 2001. Um, one of the last times he was recorded at Montreux, but he appeared there a number of times over the years. And that is my last slide. Any questions? I'd love to know what your dollar per gig or trip per terabyte is, just uh, as, as, as a general sense, you know, because you get a lot of guys in your business, right? You Scality, you got yeah. Clever Safe, you got, I mean, Storage Grid, you got a bunch of these guys. Phil, do you want to answer that? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no as, a gen as a general, as a general, what, what you guys go at the market at, you say you're dollar, everyone's got a kind of a dollar per gig kind of thing. Because yeah. that's, you know, from an object perspective, you guys are doing erasure coding and from a feature, from a at least a general feature set, it's kind of what these other guys are all coming to market with. And yeah. at some point, you know, when you're storing in this tier, it's about price. Sure. Yeah, there certainly is, uh, is a sign, yeah. A strong economic component to the value proposition yeah. of object storage at scale. Um, as I said up front, we've got the capability of vertical integration. So you would expect we're very competitive on that point. Um, you know, considerably under cloud economics. Yeah, yeah w without quoting dollars on, on okay. camera, because that will probably come back. Yeah, right, you're right. We're not going to do that. Right. Um, <laughs> Just remember, tried to we, we, tried to trip you up. Yeah, just remember, we build all the hard drives in those systems, and that's what eighty percent of the bill of materials of the that system. Helps. So it's it's fairly significant what we can do with with these capabilities. Hmm, that's actually a good point. 